But the number one concern for Lockridge was that the actual core of this submarine is made of carbon fiber, which is not used at the, in deep ocean submersibles. So he examined a section of it and found that it was filled with little holes. He, it was delaminating these layers. It was porous. He held a light behind it and found that the light was streaming through, and he refused to sign off on the dive. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. I've heard the OceanGate CEO described as drinking his own Kool-Aid from two separate sources. The first was Jay Bloom, a client, a business tycoon that Stockton Rush went to woo in Vegas earlier this year, unsuccessfully, thankfully. He He walked me through it and then we talked about the safety concerns and I think... He had so much passion for the project uh, that he was blinded by it. He wasn't objective and he didn't look at things uh, that I saw and that others saw that were problematic because it just didn't fit his narrative. And then the second was Rob McCullum, a co-founder of EYOS Expeditions and a man who, like Stockton Rush, had transported tourists to the Titanic in the 2000s. But uh, he was using Soviet submarines that had been certified to 6,000 meters. McCullum, though, takes it further and he says everyone was drinking Kool-Aid. In other words, it wasn't just the CEO, it was everyone. And that there was a kind of megalomania going on at OceanGate where nearly everyone was suffering from delusions of grandeur. And who is the source of this obsessive megalomania? Wasn't it Stockton Rush himself? But there was one man who wasn't sleepwalking through Kool-Aid-induced dreams. He was the Scotsman, whose name many of us know by now, David Lockridge, an extremely capable and experienced submersible pilot. Lockridge's aha moment wasn't rocket science. You didn't need degrees in engineering or some sort of advanced training at Boeing, NASA or MIT. All you had to do was hold a particular material in front of a light and ask yourself, can I see any holes? And guess what? Lockridge could. Before we get to the rest of this analysis, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So according to the article in The New Yorker, quote, To to assess the carbon fiber hull, Lockridge examined a small cross-section of material. He found that it had very visible signs of delamination and porosity. Porosity is a little bit like something that's Swiss cheese. It's um, porous. It's got a lot of little holes in it. And it seemed possible to Lockridge that after repeated dives, it would come apart. And so what he was seeing right in front of him was actual evidence of cyclic failure. You could see that it was degenerating, it was eroding. This was proof of that. And so what he then did was he shone a light at the sample from behind and then photographed beams streaming through splits and cracks in the midsection in a what appeared to be a disturbing, irregular pattern. It's almost like seeing tears in the fabric this carbon fiber fabric, and then realizing, wow, this is what this already uh, weakened material is the shielding around the that elongated tubular section, the cylindrical part that was made out of stainless steel. Looking at this, Lockridge realized that the only safe way to dive was to first carry out a full scan of the hull. And so he wrote the following recommendation. He said, Until suitable corrective actions are in place, Titan should not be manned during any of the upcoming trials. Rush was furious. This is it all. It was fine being on board the Ocean Gate flagship as long as you were all drinking the Kool-Aid and towing the line. As long as you weren't rocking the apple cart. As long as you were allowing the CEO to have his hero moment uninterrupted, uncontested. However, if you dared step out of line and turned off the Kool-Aid waterfall everyone was bathing in, well then God help you. Rush sprang into action after getting this this information. He, He called a meeting that same day and actually recorded it on his phone. It seems he also had his lawyer present. 
For two hours, the Ocean Gate brass exchanged jugs of Kool-Aid. No whole testing is going to be necessary. They congratulated themselves. Why? Because we can do acoustic monitoring, and that will let us know if there's any danger in terms of the hull. It seems the idea was that on January 19, 2018, which is more than five years ago, the day Lockridge handed in a written report basically declaring the Titan project patently unsafe in the form, in the shape and form that it was, well, the knee-jerk reaction was just denial, and we'll do something else. We'll develop a monitoring system to listen for snaps and crackles so that we don't have to uh, do the whole certification thing, which would set us back and would take us back to um, fit for purpose and, you know, let's, let's, let's find new materials for this. And I mean, really, you're going to put in a monitoring system to listen for snaps and crackles. Isn't human hearing already doing that? And in Lockridge's case, uh, a simple eye test, the simple visuals that he could see right in front of him. Look, I'm looking at the material right now. I can see it's degrading. I can see it's delaminating. Well, we're not going to pay attention to that. Now, according to the New Yorker, the company would uh, use a system that would alert the pilot to the possibility of catastrophic failure with enough time to arrest the descent and safely return to surface. That's according to the company's own statement. But then Lockridge responded via court filing. I think it was written by his lawyer. His lawyer wrote, quote, This type of acoustic analysis would only show when a component is about to fail. In other words, I, I think the word that really needs to be there is the word imminent, is that this type of acoustic analysis is only going to tell you when there's imminent failure. But when there's imminent failure, it's kind of too late. The ship has sailed. Isn't it a fait accompli, right? And so it does say, uh, you know, Th this sort of thing would only let you know milliseconds before an implosion. It, and it also, this is quite crucial, it would not detect any existing flaws prior to putting pressure onto the hull. So in other words, there's already a flaw, there's already weakness. Is it going to tell you about that? It's only going to tell you when the, the flaw is actually being destroyed, right? And a really good way to think about it is if you think about wood, Wood is um, vertical, in a way, vertical carbon fiber. Now, can you imagine if um, the carbon fiber was wrapped around a, uh, a, a tree stem in a circular fashion, right? And then you hit that, that, um, that structure with an axe. All you would need to do is get between those coils. And it just gives you an idea of, how ineffective it would be. As soon as you break one coil, all of them become less tense. According to the article, a former senior employee who was present at this meeting said that we didn't even have a baseline for this whole idea in terms of the acoustic analysis. We didn't know what it would sound like if something did go wrong. In other words, a lot of sound and fury occurs at this meeting in January 2018, all aimed at a singular conceit to avoid proper testing, to avoid proper safety protocols, to avoid facing reality, to avoid paying the price to, in, in terms of dealing with reality. Ocean Gate's lawyer wrote, Mr. Lockridge was not comfortable with Ocean Gate's testing protocol, while Mr. Rush was unwilling to change the company's plans. Lockridge was fired and the company then persisted with its plans. In other words, the captain's bridge was once again awash with Kool-Aid. And I think the carbon fiber insanity reflects a much greater malaise that had infected seemingly all aboard. Well, all who were aboard and were apparently on board with what was going on that was maybe not necessarily above board. Think about the attitude to the carbon fiber, which doesn't take a materials engineer... Uh, you know, qualification to appreciate and the laissez-faire attitude to towing the submersible um, behind the ship during this year's botched, cancelled, scuppered and eventually fatal missions. I mean, doing that was like doing a firewalk while pulling a marshmallow behind you on a string. It was like 
Instead of putting your surfboard on the roof of your car, you drag it on the road behind you. Now, as bad as the Kool-Aid surrounding the carbon fiber was, it wasn't the end of Lockridge's concerns. And this is where we get a deeper sense of Captain Kirk perhaps being closer to Colonel Sanders. Is he managing, maintaining and leading a craft and its crew? Or is he playing chicken with people's lives? Now, according to the article, quote, on January 18, 2018, Lockridge studied each component. So he did a very uh, comprehensive analysis of the entire craft. And what he did was he found several critical aspects that were defective or unproven. It wasn't just the carbon fiber. It was glue coming away from the seams of ballast bags, mounting bolts that appeared uh, to be facing imminent rupture, sealing faces and errant plunge holes and O-ring grooves that deviated from standard design parameters. The exostructure and electrical pods used different metals, which could result in galvanic corrosion when exposed to seawater. The thruster cables posed snagging hazards. The iridium satellite beacon to transmit the submersible's position after surfacing was attached with zip ties. Just went on and on. The flooring, highly flammable. The interior vinyl wrapping could emit highly toxic gases if it ignited. And on and on and on. And so you say, well, what about the seven-inch acrylic window? Well, Lockridge said that he requested documents from Ocean Gate's engineering director about this window and pressure tests, had pressure tests been conducted. But he said that he was met with hostility. When he asked for, for information about it, he was denied access. He wasn't given the necessary documentation. Can you see it's people that are drunk on Kool-Aid. And so according to the article, Lockridge noted in his report to Rush and other members of the Ocean Gate leadership that verbal communications of the key items had been dismissed on several occasions. And so now I feel I must make this report official. It's got to be written down. I would to take that step. And so you get this idea that he's dismissed, dismissed, dismissed. And is, is he only there to just to, to sort of for the for the legal the legality of everything. And so during the meeting where the carbon fiber was declared a non issue, Lockridge said he'd also discovered that the Titans viewport was certified, I guess he did this independently, to a pressure of only one thousand three hundred meters below sea level. I got a bad feeling about this. So in terms of the window when Lockridge said, you know, you want to go down to four thousand meters it's only certified to 1,300. Did they go back to the drawing board? Did they test? Did they change? Did they do, did they do anything substantive about the oversized viewport? It doesn't appear so. No, it seems they simply persisted. Why? Well, isn't it because of megalomania? And so David Lockridge would li- later write, I don't want to be seen as a tattletale. But I'm so worried that he kills himself, meaning Stockton Rush, in the quest to boost his his ego. And then he said, I would consider myself pretty ballsy because he had so much experience in so many theaters in terms of submersible um, environments. And so he said, you know, I consider myself quite ballsy when it comes to doing this sort of thing, even things that are quite dangerous. But that sub is an accident waiting to happen. There's no way on earth you could have paid me to dive the thing. And so if there are lawsuits coming, well, here's your star witness. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.